Hello. Welcome <laughs> to episode one of my law investigation series here on Twitch and YouTube. Of course, Shemu Dojo. A um, little bit different than the usual streams that you're accustomed to with the dojo here, obviously normally with myself and Matt, but today doing a bit of a solo one. Um, basically, I'm not this bit of a disclaimer. I'm not one to suggest I'm very good at Chinese mythology or um, all of the Chinese law. Just turn the volume up here a little bit on my mic. Hopefully that's a little bit better for you. Thank you very much for the follow. Crescent the Hedgehog. Appreciate it. So yeah, I'm not one to say that I'm going to be very good at this Chinese mythology stuff that we're going to be looking into, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to, to do this series in the first place is to like kind of learn um, whilst we um, we sort of learn together a bit. Um, hello, Terry. Thanks for joining us, mate. No, that one this afternoon was actually a little bit of a test of me and Matt were doing, just to make sure everything was going okay. And I want to give a massive shout out to Matt because he spent probably about two hours last night and an hour or so today helping me get this sorted. And um, it's been a bit of a difficult one because I'm very new to like OBS and setting up all the stream stuff. But I think it's come out quite well. Hopefully it, it comes well um in the end hopefully there's no issues with my camera or my audio issues or anything with the the stream or the um, the browser you can see i've just at the moment i've just got an image on the screen which is pretty cool last minute idea that was to put the, the thumbnail as the big screen so in a moment when we get into some of the things that we're going to be getting into um just above me will be my browser it's actually going to be my whole desktop um so hopefully i don't show anything too um incriminating <laughs> um but uh, that's where you'll be be able to learn some stuff along with me we'll do some research together um hello mike franz hello to retro godfather and of course matt in the chat there just moderating for me a little bit um much appreciated guys so because of the format of this how we're going to do it i'm hoping to sort of stay live till about 11 p.m bst so that's two hours from now um i don't want it to go over really because i want to kind of keep these as like nice episodes potentially something i can edit down if needs be um and uh, have it like as a bit of a video for people to enjoy so we're going to get stuck in first let's just get rid of this and like i say guys if there's any issues with the sound or my camera freezes or something like that just let me know and i'll try and sort it asap i've got obs over here i've got like three monitors on the go so hopefully um we can manage this quite well. So, firstly, this is a post from Switch, obviously over at Phantom Riverstone. This is um, Patreon that you can see here. It's obviously it's a, an early post, so probably a lot of people haven't actually seen this post at the moment. I'm not sure if he's teased it, but um, we're going to go through this. This is a, a bit of a taster, actually, of what you get if you were... <laughs> Was subscribed to Switch's um, Patreon, but he did tell me that is he's, he's going to be releasing this post on the fourth of April, so it's going to be pretty cool to to go through there. And hey, up sheep, how you doing, man? Thank you for joining me. Um, and obviously, if you can't see anything, I can I'm a little look there. We can always zoom in. If I there we go, it's probably a little bit better, so you guys can see what's going on here. It's going to be a lot of me like just reading stuff. Um, well, there you go then, Terry. So you can you can kind of follow it along with me. It's insane, actually, absolutely insane. When when I first read through this post, um, there's some stuff I didn't even realise. So hopefully um, this sort of leads us in different directions, and we can kind of see where we we end up uh, in our research. So. The Phoenix and Dragon Mirrors lie at the core of Shemu's story right from the beginning with Landy and his henchmen seizing one of the mirrors from the Hazuki, Hazuki Dojo in the shocking opening scene of Owao's murder. From there, Ryo stumbles upon a web of interconnected topics and events ranging from the significance of constellations in the sky to an imperial order made long ago. In this post, we will carry out an in-depth review of several interrelated elements and clues that Ryo learns along his journey in the course of the first three games and see how they fit together. We'll also highlight a number of translation clarifications along the way where the English version of certain lines gives a different, possibly even 
incorrect impression from the original Japanese. And spoiler warning, of course, I'm pretty sure no one here is watching that hasn't played any of the games, so we should be okay. So these are the topics we're going to be covering. You can see a crazy list of topics. Um, I won't read through them because obviously we're going to get through them as we go. So we're going to start our exploration with the Phoenix Mirror that Ryo discovers early in the first game in the basement of the dojo. He visits the Russia China shop in Dubuita and shows it to the shop owner. Um, Shu Yu Xia. I don't know if I got that right. <laughs> so this is the Ancients' Beliefs, the Guardians of the North Star. And I've actually got a playlist that I kind of prepared earlier. So we're going to get to that cutscene first. And we're going to watch it first before we read the next part of the content. Welcome to the new people in the chat there, Abdullah. Thanks for coming, man. And that's Asian Ashley. Much appreciated. Um, let me know, guys. Uh, obviously, I've set this so that the video is actually quieter than the mic, so that I can talk over it if needs be. But do let me know if it's a little bit too quiet or even a little bit too loud. And here we go. Hello. Oh, Hazuki-san. Thanks for your help the other day. But can I ask for your help with one more thing? What is it? It's about this mirror. Can you tell me anything about it? Let me see it. This is a very unusual mirror. It's called the Phoenix Mirror. Phoenix. In China, the phoenix is the legendary bird of fortune. It's a guardian for the Sky Lord. Guardian? The other guardian is the dragon. A dragon? In China, people consider the North Star to be the Lord of the Sky. Look there. That is an old Chinese map in stone, see? It's a map of the Big Dipper from the Han Dynasty. On a moonless night. Should you pray to the stars, your wishes shall be realized. The Big Dipper revolves around the immovable North Star. In China, the North Star is highly respected. For ages and ages, people have worshipped it. In China, there are numerous fascinating legends about the stars. I see. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And there's the Big Dipper. Nice picture that is actually. Apparently, is that like, um, I think it's made of wood, like a wooden uh, picture frame there. And I don't know, actually, did you notice? Not sure I ever noticed these when I played it originally, but is that like a China? I know it's a Russia China shop. Is that supposed to be a China kettle? Is that a thing? Was it a teapot, I guess? You'd have a, a China teapot. Um, so yeah, so obviously she just mentioned about the kind of the mythical beasts, uh, the dragon and the phoenix being guardians. And obviously the, the North Star um, is a massive sort of a coveted thing in Chinese mythology that we're going to look into. And I, I want to that's one of the things I'm, I'm quite fascinated with, actually, like the stars and the constellations and stuff. So hopefully we can try and delve into that a little bit. Let me just say hi to the new guys in the chat. Matthew Sisk, welcome. Welcome, AA. Just in time. Doing good. Thank you. Um, yeah, Terry, I was trying to get, if possible, I, I don't know, I'd have to double check through the videos, but I think I've gone for all of the English just to make it a little bit easier for people to... Um, listen if perhaps they're not looking at the same sort of time um so you have to put up with the english voices i'm afraid <laughs> and uh yeah i agree crescent the hedgehog I, i've always really liked the english dub despite it you know being 
a little bit cheesy, whatever people would have it say, or bad. <laughs> it's not too bad, I don't think. Welcome, Fader. Right, so let's continue with the post. So going off of that, obviously these are the points that we're going to emphasize now. So she explained the significance that people in China attach to the phoenix and that it has a presence in the night sky. So in China, the phoenix is a legendary bird of fortune. It's a guardian for the sky lord. The phoenix is a legendary bird of fortune. It's a guardian for the sky lord. So again, I don't want to say that I'm any good with like Chinese mythology. So there's going to be a sky lord and then a phoenix below that. Is that what they mean? Um, or the sky lord could be the north star, I suppose. Is that what she said? The other guardian, in, the, the other guardian is the dragon in China. People consider the north star to be the lord of the sky. Yeah, okay. she just literally just said that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, she points to the map. That's an old Chinese map set in stone, so not wood. That was my bad. She yeah, she must have actually said that. As I said, wood. So I'm looking to fool again. And it's a big, it's a map of the Big Dipper from the Han Dynasty. So one of the things I want to do a little bit later, I've I've got this is part of my. Uh, ability to use the the uni because I'm, I'm part of the open university I, they've got like an online library so one of the, the books that i found here is the handbook of chinese mythology so at some point i, I do want to um <laughs> delve into this i did just notice the word han somewhere so the han dynasty according to this is the year 206 bc to 220 ce what does CE mean? Does anyone know what that means? So you've got before Christ, right? And I don't know about CE, but I'm assuming that just means like 206 years before year zero, current era. Okay, cheers for dropping. Fair enough, yeah, that makes sense with this. So another thing that we're going to come to a little bit later is that 1910 date that we've heard quite a lot about. If you've been playing Shemu 3, they mentioned that quite a lot. Um, that's because of the emperor that was, um, you know, had the, the mirrors made, yeah, same as AD, okay. So they had the mirrors made in this sort of period of time that we're going to get to a little bit later. So that's going to be something we can look into. Um, but let's just continue with Switch's post for now because I think he's done a really good job and this is a perfect introduction to what I want to do. Um, so on a moonless night, you should pray to the stars or should you pray to the stars, your wishes sh shall be realised. And actually, one of the things I do do, I don't know if anyone else is the same, but when you've got like a clear sky or you, you go outside and at night time and you look, look at, you know, look up and see the stars, I always, for some reason, it's easy to find than you think the Big Dipper. I always know, you know, it's there kind of thing, that shape. And then there's always a brighter star, isn't there? Like a little bit higher, which I believe is the North Star. The, um, the Cassiopeia star line or whatever is a lot harder to find, I feel like. Um, but the, the Big Dip is quite easy to say to, to see. Um, so yeah, she's there, Shemfua, praying to the stars. Obviously, she's very much of that mindset, isn't she? She's always praying. You've seen her in a lot of cutscenes, uh, especially on the cliff side, you know, towards the end of Shemu 2. She's praying, actually praying to the stars. And we will get to that bit, but I'm, just while I've thought about it, that's when she realises that the North Star flickered. And she realised that something bad had happen, happened. AD means after death now, does it? Because it used to be like something like something domino, right? But yeah, I'd not heard of CE actually. Um, so the Big Dipper revolves around the immovable North Star. In China, the North Star is highly respected. For ages and ages, people have worshipped it. In China, there are numerous fascinating legends about the stars. And Rio just says, I see. So, in Western astrono astronomy, the Big Dipper is not technically defined as a constellation, but what is known as an asterism, which is a recognisable pattern of stars that is not a formal co constellation, but can often be part of one. In the case of the Big Dipper, it's part of the constellation Ursa Major, the Big Bear, or the Great Bear, sorry, as shown below, positioned nearby is the North Star. So yeah, that's interesting. You do always see that sort of cluster. You see them because for some reason that shape is quite prominent in the sky, despite there being like all these other stars that 
could confuse you, I suppose. I've never actually looked for the, the full bear. And the North Star is there. And that's joined to the little bear. Okay. But you do you do often see this really bright star just a little bit above the Big Dipper, um, which is the North Star. And I don't know if that means, again, this is showing my <laughs> naivety, but does that mean that if you were out at night and you were lost, you could look for that star. I think this is something I've heard about, but you could just walk in that direction and you know you'd be going north. Is that true? Because it never moves. It's always north. Or have I just made that up? <laughs> Asking the chat for answers to stuff that I'm researching. But if anyone knows that, uh, let me know. So Shiryu, Anno Domini, Summit uh, Domini, Anno Domini, Domini, Year of Our Lord. Okay, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so she introduces another connection between the phoenix and dragon as seen on the mirrors. The set of the seven stars that we know as the Big Dipper are considered in China to represent the phoenix, with another set of five stars and a W shape representing the dragon. According to Shui, Shui Yi, Shui Yi, going to butcher all these names as well, the phoenix and dragon are the guardians of the North Star, which is itself considered to be the god, um, the lord of the sky. So that's a really good image actually for showing that off. Um, so you can see the, can you see my cursor? You can see my cursor, can't you? So the W-shaped set of stars representing the dragon is a constellation named Capi, uh, Cassiopeia. That's the one we just mentioned there. But you can see actually there's so many stars in the night sky that it's, it can be quite difficult actually to di uh, detect. I think this Cassiopeia, um, but this one's quite recognisable if you if you did want to like look at the sky and try and find this for yourself. Yo Escutin. Uh, and JP Asher, welcome in. Um do do do. So this picture shows the relative position of Cassiopeia, the dragon, the big dipper, the phoenix, and the north star, which is the sky lord. Shui Yu's use of the word immovable with respect to the North Star refers to the fact that it is an unusual characteristic of this star compared to others, is that it's always it always stays in, in roughly the same place in the sky over the course of 24 hours. Yeah. So I think that's basically saying that it's always north of where you're looking. Would that make sense? I guess so, because obviously the, the planet's round, isn't it? You can't look at the star from the other side so that obviously my view of it is north someone else's view of it would be south because they'd be you know in australia <laughs> or is that is that confirming that the the earth is around them basically if this star is always in the sky hmm <laughs> i don't want to uh, add to to any conspiracy theories there is it possible that a star never moves? It must move in terms of like day and night. So the star would be going around like that, right? Or all the planet would be going around. The star would always move. Yeah, so so people would see. So Australia in 12 hours from now would see the North Star at night because it'd be night time for them. So yeah, the stars never move. So the, the I think that confirms that the Earth is round more so than flat. Right? Just saying. Uh, the Han Dynasty, mentioned as the era in which the star map was made, was an imperial dynasty of China. So this is the 202 BC to 9 AD. 25 to 220 AD. Let me just read that again. So the Han Dynasty. So that's the period of the Han Dynasty. So that lasted for... Does that mean that lasted for like 418 years? Or was why was there a break? So from there to nine, and then it's there was a break, 25 to 220. I think it means the movement of the Big Dipper is consistent with the movement of the Earth. Yeah, but the stars don't move, do they? When you think about it, the sky doesn't move. 
just the planet just spins, rotates. So the space around us is always stationary. But then why would that be a characteristic of the North Star? That it stays roughly the same place. But the other stars don't. Don't know. Oh, Matt with the Lord. The dynasty was briefly interrupted by the Shin dynasty. Oh, you must have Googled this, Matt. Right, okay. That makes sense. I could have done that. To be fair, uh, the Shin dynasty, which was established by... Oh, what's that word? Usurping. Usurping region, Regent Wang Mang, and is thus separated into two periods, the Western Han and the Eastern Han. Okay. <laughs> yeah, imagine if you just came out with that. <laughs> Upsurping. Okay, that's quite a new word anyway. Even if you've uh, corrected the typo, it's still a new word to me. Upsurping. I'll have to put that one in my vocabulary. So there do not seem to be further references to this era in the game, however, it and is, and is likely mentioned to highlight how far the cultural significance of the star stars go back. Yeah, because you do hear, I'm sure you do hear them say, someone mentions the Han Dynasty, it could have been the China Lady just. Um, so yeah, that's kind of shows you how far, how, how far back these um, Chinese mythology sort of stories and stuff go. So the Big Dipper is mentioned several times throughout the games and other instances in Shenmue 2 when Ryo and Ren are handcuffed together and lie low on the roof of a building overnight and they observe the Big Dipper above. This is further foreshadowing of its importance in the story. Uh, obviously remember that scene where they're handcuffed together, Ren goes for a little tinkle <laughs> and um, they both sit and watch the stars, don't they? And uh, that's a good representation actually of the, the Big Dipper that you can see. I have got a video. Right, okay. So we'll go into the next video now, guys. This one, let me just go, I'll give the plugs to the channels that they're on. So this is Sega Fan. He's only got six subscribers. He's got seven now. That's a really cool video. It's got all of the um, the mirror clips in there. We're going to go back to a couple in a minute. And then this one, I feel like this is a video. I don't know if he's in the chat, but I feel like this is a Sergi Ness video even though it's hosted on Shemu fans. This feels like a Shemu unofficial video to me, but I might be wrong on that, but let's watch this together because this is a, a pretty interesting video and it also shows that uh, cutscene at the start with Ren and Ryo looking up at the stars. The Big Dinner. So the Big Dip is seven stars. Seven, the number seven. I'm going to pause this just in case I miss it. I'm not going to read the Mandarin or the, Ch the Cantonese. So it symbolizes togetherness. It is a lucky number for relationships. It is also recognized as the luckiest number in the West and is one of the rare numbers that is great in both Chinese and many Western cultures. Seven stars. Obviously, it's an ongoing theme as well with the Sword of the Seven Stars. It's a lucky number. I suppose you do get like the your jackpot seven seven seven, isn't it? Um, that possibly could be the where that originated from. Is that luckiest number in the West? Okay, I was going to say could because um, those type of slot machines and stuff could have been designed by you know the Chinese or Japanese or something. Which is why seven seven. I'm just trying to say why the the jackpot might be seven seven seven. But yeah, it's it's a lucky number all over the the world by the looks of it. In China, people consider the North Star to be the Lord of the Sky. Look there. That is an old Chinese map in stone, see? It's a map of the Big Dipper from the Han Dynasty. On a moonless night. She did mention Han Dynasty, yeah. Should you pray to the stars, your wishes... Let me skip, because we just watched that. So Polaris is the North Star, there's the Big Dipper. 
the Big Dipper revolves around the immovable North Star. Right, okay. So we're kind of learning stuff here. So I did just see in the chat, apparently in East Asia, the lucky number is eight. So, okay, fair enough. I just got that wrong <laughs> myself. Um, but did you see that? So I'm, just, I'm still trying to work out what's going on with this bloody star. So if the sky, if the planet is rotating, how do the other stars move around this one star? Or is it just like a concept? It just seems like it's happening like that because of the way that the seasons, as the seasons change. It's weird, isn't it? Or is it because the stars and you know all the planets or whatever in the solar system all moving at different rates? I don't know. I'm not going to go into that because that's probably I'm making myself sound a bit like a a dum dum. <laughs> but this is where the uh, this sort of um, swastika symbol symbolization, which I believe is like a good thing, obviously. It wasn't in terms of like Germany and Nazis or whatever it was, Hitler, Hitler's regime. regime. But uh, this is still quite a, a lucky symbol, as far as I'm aware. And welcome, Stuart. Yeah, law investigation, which we're in the process of at the moment. Just watching a few videos and um, going through some notes, which is pretty cool. Interesting. I still can't wrap my head around why the Big Dipper moves and the North Star doesn't. Are they sure, like, everything isn't rotating still? But obviously you would never know because the middle star, if you think of the middle star as a ball, you'd never know what side you were looking at, would you? So that the middle, everything could be rotating... But because of the pivot in the middle, this this ball in the middle, the North Star, it appears like it's not moving, but it could just be spinning. That could, if you think of that as like an ax, ax, axis, ax, axle, an axle on the axis. It says axis, isn't it? I was right. Um, possibly. Oh, got here. So that's where that swastika patterns come from, the Big Dippers. And I'm guessing these are all the uses of that swastika. Hopefully we're not going to get the uh, the channel banned here, Matt, by uh, leaving this on the screen too much. Um, but you can see it's different uses around the, the globe. The ages, people have worshipped it. Right, so before the Nazis made it into a hate symbol, the swastika was the symbol of good luck for thousands of years. Many countries like India, Japan and China revered the ancient sign. The word swastika is a Sanskrit word, thwastika, meaning it is well-being, good existence and good luck. However, it was also known by, by different names in different countries, like Wan in China, Manji in Japan, Flea Fot in England, Hacken Kuz in Germany, and Tetraskalion or Tetragamandian in Greece. Why the why did they get bigger and bigger? Did they not just settle on <laughs> one word for it. Alright Matt, thanks man. Take care, buddy see all the uses there of it so in buddhism the swastika is a symbol of good fortune prosperity abundance and eternity it is directly related to buddha and can be found carved on statues on the soles of his feet and on his heart it is said that it contains the mind of the buddha will do buddy thank you The swastika is considered to symbolize the auspicious footprints of the Buddha. It is an aniconic symbol for the Buddha. Ooh. 
like the Makop. Um, for the Buddha in many parts of Asia and a homologous with the Dwarma heat wheel. The shape symbolizes eternal cycling, a theme found in Samsara doctrine of Buddhism. Mm, interesting, Stuart. In Japanese Buddhism, the Manji swastika is an ancient spiritual symbol that represents the universe in harmony. It represents the intrinsic interchange of the opposites in life, heaven and earth, light and darkness, etc. This harmony comes from the power that cares and provides for all things. How's it going? Did you find something? Hey. Heavily beasts. What is it? <laughs> Vader. <laughs> These are the four heavenly beasts. Same picture that's on those sticks that Oman gave you. Look. Hey, that statue looks fishy. Hmm. Statue of Buddha. Well, check carefully. mentioned that cutscenes something that you don't typically see um i suppose if you just run around the room and grab all the keys and put them in the thing you're not gonna see that too much but that's quite an interesting little cutscene um these are the japanese kanji symbols for north east south and west um what you got you've got kita nishi is it Minami and Higashi, I believe. So I, I'm guessing that's on the other side of that four heavenly beasts thing. So you can see the north, the south, the east and west. It's just mentioned there. Sort of like the universe of whatever it said. What did it say? I nearly had that. The universe and harmony, those four things. And you think, think about like heaven, earth, comrades, nine dragons, that sort of thing. That is like that kind of style on the selector as well. They've kind of gone for that sort of whether, whether or not that's that's tied into this kind of a theme. It's the four heavenly beasts, the four, you know, makes the universe in harmony. <laughs> hey, hi Aaron. How you doing buddy? Nice to see you in here. Let's carry on. Oh, okay. So let's have a quick look at that. So you've got your black tortoise up there. What was the name of that? That's Xuan Wu, black tortoise. And you've got your azure dragon. Ching Ching Wong, possibly. I don't want to try and pronounce these badly. Bai Hu. That's that's the reason why for so many years people got that sort of connection to Master Bai Hu, the white tiger, and obviously that's the sort of the thing that's on the back of Ryo Hazuki's jacket as well. And the vermilion bird at the bottom there, Zhu Q. Which had me thinking, because of this kind of theme, not so much actually now actually seeing the names of them, because you think of like dragon, phoenix, snake tortoise, and tiger, right? So you'd think perhaps there could be four mirrors, but in hindsight, they're actually above those sort of things, aren't they? So that was like a, a vermilion, vermilion bird. Is that still a phoenix? Does anyone know? Is that still classed as a phoenix? And that I'm guessing it is. It's just like the full name for those things. Uh, it's cool how the geography of Kowloon relates to the heavenly beasts as well, with the fountains dotted about and the names of the buildings nearby. Yeah, very much so. I think the White Tiger Fountain in Kowloon is close to where the Tiger Gate building was before it got scrapped as well. Okay. Do you reckon they came up with those names, Stu? You, you don't think those actually were named that back in the day in Kowloon? Or had similar sort of names, like themed names per building, perhaps? But yeah, I guess there could still be a chance that there is four mirrors, maybe? Like a Tiger Mirror and a Black Tortoise Mirror? A snake tortoise, there's the snake there. I'm 
Right, so the black tortoise represents the north, winter, and the water element. It's also known as the turtle snake, and it looks like a tortoise entwined with a snake. This myth, myth oh God, I'm trying to get my words out here. This mythological creature is commonly associated with longevity and wisdom. The white tiger represents the west, autumn, metal element, and the virtue of righteousness. He guards Buddha's teachings and mankind. Very good. Obviously, whenever you think about tigers and stuff, I mean, Master Bayou has that white paint on his face, doesn't he? Uh, whether or not that re represents the whiteness of this tiger. I don't know if there's any reference there to Rio with tiger swallow style or, you know, tiger... Tigers in general. South of Phoenix, Phoenix West can also be Shilan. What's Shilan? Was that um, something that was named here? Shilan? Not sure on that one. Let's continue. By the way, anyone else in this music that's playing, for some reason, now it's because it keeps looping and looping, I keep hearing this like scream in the background. It sounds like a dog barking. I don't know if that's actually in the, uh, the actual song, but... I can't like unhear it now, kind of like you can't un unsee something. Right, the vermilion bird represents the south, summer, and the fire element. It looks like a red pheasant, although sometimes it's depicted with multicolored plumage. In Chinese mythology and culture, the phoenix represents yin, the Chinese emperor, uh, sorry, the Chinese empress, feminim femininity virtue and good fortune so that's interesting so there's a reference to the um, the empress so when we get to the dragon perhaps it'll mention the emperor Okay, the azure dragon represents the east. And this is where you get those leaders, isn't it? We've always heard like these supposed to be four leaders. What's it like? Ten, tentai, gentai, um, kotai, and some other tai probably. Um, those are like the four leaders. Uh, sorry, Shilin. It's Shilin and Vietnamese who get mixed up. It's an animal from Chinese mythology, kind of like a dragon tiger thing okay interesting i don't think i've ever seen that before or if i have um can't visualize it at the moment um represents the east spring and the wood element hmm. I, 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 i'm not making connections to other things but obviously this is the fire so that's why we've got niao sun who represents the phoenix you know this vermilion bird is niao sun in a sort of red outfit, you know, it makes sense. Black tortoise, I mean, we can have a look in a moment at, um, I think I've got somewhere, actually, I don't know if they're on the screen or I bookmark them, but the four leaders, like I just mentioned, like Tentai and stuff, black tortoise could possibly be... Could that be Tentai? Who have you got? You've got the, the... I don't think we actually know the names fully yet, so that's not going to solve that sort of issue. But well, he's winter. That's autumn. Metal. What was he? Water. Okay. So there's going to be two more leaders. So you've got Yolandi and Nyausun. There's going to be two more that we're going to come across at some point who... I mean, I'm trying to think of what would would be for Landy, and all I'm thinking is like a dojo site kind of, um, like a wooden dojo or something. Um, maybe I'm just going looking a little bit too much into these words here, mainly because of the the word fire. From that one, actually, does tie quite nicely to 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 Niao Sun. <laughs> okay, so this supports and maintains the country. 
It controls the rain uh, and it's the symbol of the Emperor's power. Often paired with the phoenix, for the two represent both conflict and wedded bliss. Bloody hell. I've just, from reading the word wedded there, and I'm not like considering the marriage thing, but you know that uh, image of Shemfor? I don't know if it's this one. I've got these images here. Let me see if I've got one. You know, where she's in a, like a white robes. Very, very wedding dress esque, actually. I don't think it's one of these images. That's still quite a nice um, outfit of Shenfors there. I'm sure you guys know what I'm on about, where she's in her white robes. Yo, Joseph. How you doing, buddy? Um, kind of. I mean, you can say whatever you want. That's the, the whole reason why I've gone for a stream sort of format here, so we can, like, sort of discuss and learn i don't know if i'm very good at learning yeah Stuart. both conflict and wedded bliss all i'm trying to think is, is like how this kind of relates you know i've i've seen shemfar in that white outfit could that be like a bit of a um what's that word like um i did read that word early actually like foreshadowing like a foreshadowing for you know perhaps in this is crazy stuff, but like if she is or she's got some sort of ancestors from like these periods that we're talking about all the way back in like the King Dynasty. Um... If that, that was a thing, perhaps she got married, not not suggesting she got married to Landy. <laughs> Okay, so Joe says, I was studying the clothes of Shenfor's parents and social classes of Tang Dynasty, capital being the Yuang. So that is, you're saying the clothing that they're wearing in that cutscene where, you know, Shenfor's in, in the little baby basket thing on the tree, right? That clothing. If that was in her house and she remembers 100 birthdays, then I think the origin of the Tang Dynasty is very interesting. Okay, so... Tang Dynasty is something I'm going to try and make a mention of because we're going to... I'll write it down here, actually. Um, I should make some notes in terms of like future things we can look. So Tang Dynasty, that's Shenfuar's parents, which is very interesting, actually, when you think about that cutscene that you do see. When she, I should have had that queued up, actually, but where she's on the swing... Um, again, tie by yeah. David Deville did a, a, I think it was an interview. Wasn't it quite a ways back now? Must be was it like twenty fourteen something like that? Very good interview. That's something else we can have a look at actually. So according to this, that leader's name would be Gui Shi or Gentai. Which leader is that, um, Stu? Which one was we talking about there? The it's the black tortoise. It says Gentai Wear. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm completely blanked out there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. And that actually is something that I will bring up actually while we're, we're discussing this. How do I get my bookmarks on this? So I think it was this. Oh, crap. Did that just go over that? Okay. I have to get that back up. Don't worry, we'll get back to that. So it wasn't that one, it must be the other one. So I did bookmark something. That is actually quite um, interesting. I didn't think we'd get into the subject actually, but it's kind of... That one. I think it's this one. No, it's not. Just hang on a second, let me just get back, that back up. Um, Shenson sent me this early actually. Oh, he sent it as images. Okay, let me save these quick. Actually, I can open them over here. So this is on Discord. So this is the guy that potentially is Gentai then. So we've seen his character artwork here. And we've also got this. 
So I think it was suggested that Nathan might have come up with this. I don't know if he came up with this image. Um, Shanson just shared this earlier. So this guy at the back here, Was this guy at the back here this guy, actually? So in that video, who were they suggesting was Gentai? So that's a different guy completely, I think, right? That's not this guy. Obviously, that's um, Project Berkeley footage, so the model could have changed, but this is the original concept artwork, so... Does look a bit different actually, yeah. It's a different guy. So this could potentially be Tentai. We could be looking at Tentai here. Um because these are your four leaders, supposedly, from this image. So this is something that someone's put for us. So we've got Landy here, um, potentially Niao Son. I mean it does look a little bit wide for my likings, but it, I suppose it could be Niao Son. Um we're not sure who this guy is or this guy, but actually this guy here. If we're led to believe from what we just learned, perhaps the white clothing of this guy here could be the he's the winter one, which is Kotai. Oh no, that's autumn. Went winter Gentai, does that resemble him then? See, I'm not sure where who's who's got this actual this could just be like speculation that. I'm just trying to catch up with the chat, sorry guys. So Tang Dynasty was ruled by Li Shimin. When he was born, two purple dragons appeared in the sky, and a fortune teller prophesied that he possessed the features of both dragon and phoenix. Okay, so Tang Dynasty was ruled by Li Shimin. I'm going to make a note of his name. This is the kind of stuff I was hoping to get, so we can like investigate a little bit. Um, okay, we're doing okay for time. So, yeah, so you're saying David supposedly saw artwork for both leaders during Shemmy Master interview with Suzuki back in the day. Snake taught us one, yeah, so yeah. So I don't know who's actually assembled these four images that we've got on the screen at the moment. That top left one could be wrong. Even the bottom left one, those are like really speculation no one really knows but the guy at the back there is quite a good tentai could be when you compare that to this guy and also this chapter artwork oh i see okay so this is where he's got those two pictures from that dude and that dude which could make sense i guess like your Niao Son, Wan Di, and then the two other leaders. But then again, this could just be a chapter artwork that just shows a few different characters similar to, you know, like that. You know, one, two, three, four. It doesn't mean that the four heavenly beasts. Do, do you know what I mean? Um. So I swear the other shadowed leader looks like an adult simming, but. Yuzuki has denied that, I believe. The other shadowed leader. Yeah, I think we did mention that at one point, didn't we? Back in the day on the forum, Stuart. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, he didn't share any details, and even after Shemu 3's release, was reluct reluctant to talk about their design specifics. But I kind of, I do, I do get that, to be honest. If he still obviously doesn't want to spoil too much for us, does he? Other two leaders, supposedly Gentai and Kotai, yeah. Oh, I guess the tiger leader is a different person from Zimming then. Um, Shemmy 2 is the best fortune teller, apparently. Um, that is the leader of the entire Tang dynasty. Okay, thanks, Joe. Speculation image I put together, nothing concrete. Oh, so you put that together, Shenson. Okay, fair enough, buddy. All I can say from the information you gathered is you should be able to guess who Gentai is. Interesting. There was no thought on the other three leaders. It was mainly referencing a bald guy. He has a staff on the mountains and a staff in his concept heart. The other thing I was thinking about is it the peach, the cherry, the the peach tree man? Doesn't he have like a, a ring of orbs around his neck, similar to that 
Um, where's it gone like that? Am I just making that up? I think that is like a very common, is it like Taoism? Taoism or something like that? Um, I'm guessing it's like oversized prayer beads or something around the neck, I don't know. Um, right, so I mean the way that the image is laid out, it could make sense that those are the two other leaders. Yep, could be Tentido, they do look the same, I think. Right, let's just crack, crack on a bit. So yeah, that's just a bit of a side point there. Just discussing the leaders, I, I suppose we won't know. Um, but that's pretty cool. That That's an, actually a nice image. If that particular artwork there, I don't know if you've seen this, guys, but on the forums, Adam, obviously Adam Sapioni did the, the Shemu documentary that's actually finished and has been burnt to discs as we speak, I imagine. Um, he's sort of shared these original artworks from the first six chapters, I believe, are there. Really great artwork here. You can, you know, look how, how crisp the quality is of that. See the black suits there with the you know, this is proper printable poster material in a sense. Um, look at Master Chen, early Master Chen um, artwork there. It's really nice to see some of this stuff in this fine detail. I mean, look how fine it is. You can actually see Wong, you know, your Sam's sort of Larry, maybe Poison Brothers are depicted there, possibly. Um, Rio with his original backpack, the sack. Really cool to see this stuff. Uh, you've got Yuan, Don't know. I don't know who these pair are. Any guesses? Anyone I might be missing there? Who's got goofy teeth? <laughs> Maybe those were unused characters. Or that random NPC that's like sat outside that pottery antique shop in <laughs> Wan Chai. Uh, not Wan Chai, um, Wise Men's Quarter, is it? Um. Here you go. I'll show all these off actually because these are amazing. We've only just had these in this condition today. Someone did mention this is obviously chapter three, which is supposed to be Suzo or Shuzo. And this is, yeah, it is the train one where we've always assumed that that footage from Project Berkeley where, you know, Rio's hanging off the side of the train. Is this chapter? Obviously, this is the only time you see a, a train depicted. Um, not sure on the face. Face looks quite evil, doesn't it? Quite menacing. I probably, in its basic resolution, just assume that would be like Landy's face, but possibly not. Looks a little bit more evil than that. These characters I don't think we've seen any of, although someone did mention that that could be the... Um, the, the, the little married couple from Niawu potentially being sort of repurposed. She does kind of look very similar to that lady, doesn't she, who um, gets a handbag stolen, etc. Not too sure on this guy. Uh, he would be the VIP guy, I guess, if that was to be the case, which I'm not sure he, he looks that much uh, similar to. Really nice artwork there. I don't know if you can tell where this actually is in China. I'm assuming there's quite quite a lot of landscapes like that. Little villages, mountains and stuff. Very cool. Hopefully someday we do get to go on a bit of a train trip. That would be an amazing. Especially if you could... What I like, or what I would like to see, and this is going off topic a little bit here, but and I felt like we had this mentioned to us with the boat from Bailu Village to Niawu, that it would be a bit, a bit of a trip that you stay on the boat, like trying to bring back the boat chapter where you can actually sit on the boat and look around and watch the scenery pass by. Just something like that would be insane. Even if it serves no purpose, maybe there's no dialogue or anything, you just sit in a room, but you can look out the window and see the scenery passing by. That'd be insane. And it would be very much like a Shemu detail. Um, that's just one of my little desires. Uh, here's the fourth chapter artwork, which I guess we assumed these were the four leaders at one point, but that, again, doesn't necessarily mean just because there's four faces there that those are four leaders, um, which we now know... Oh, we now know this guy isn't, because he's just Yan, Yan Lang, and he's already a bit of a wuss, isn't he? After <laughs> Shenfo has got admits on him. This one's interesting, because there's Zhu and Yuan Dezu um, in his wheelchair. 
very uh, is it a wheelchair i don't know actually it's a very regal looking chair almost like a stool isn't it like a seat but it has got wheels there very um, ornate chair that he's in it kind of looks like a mishmash between the chair that he's in unless i just misinterpreted that you know when you go into his room at the behind the buddha statue and he's sat there was he sat in a wheelchair or was he sat in a chair i always i thought he was just sat in a chair to be honest like a, a nice ancient chair uh, and then these have I, I i was calling them the twins up until i realized that there's now three of them so again being able to see these details is pretty cool this guy people always used to say he looked like one of the stupid people at the end of shemu 3 you know the guy that's got the bruce lee sounds and goes hi Wow, and Ren kicks him in the face. It does look a little bit like that, but hopefully to have a face that big on one of these, you know, ancient bloody chapter tiles, they didn't just use him for that. There's Landy, of course. And then this guy looks like Lau from the Virtual Fighter series, which adds up. And I suppose there's a, a potential for a claim there for that to be Tentai. As, you know, is he sort of father figure to Landy in terms of the Chiyu men? Because obviously, would his face be there if that was Zhao Suming? I feel like this is a guy that's being depicted because he's alive. You know, like here, you've got a wow, but it's very much suggesting that, you know, that's like the ghost of Christmas past. <laughs> but this is like a character that is quite prominent. So perhaps he is actually someone that could be above landing. So potentially a Tentai. And then this is nice artwork. So this is what we assume happened. So it went from Shemu 2, and then they skipped two chapters, and then we got this at the end of Shemu 2 and the start of Shemu 3, like the forest sort of meeting of Shemu 4. So it looks like this was intended to happen much later in the series, judging these the way that these chapter tiles panned out. So he's got some, I don't know if they're bow buns or... Um, medicinal medicinal herbs for a father or something but then already at this point we've got rio in this this sort of outfit i mean he was there depicted in this outfit from chapter towel three which hmm, i don't know are we led to believe obviously he's there in his, his his normal clothing there are we led to believe he's he's hit some sort of a, a martial arts status Come the third thingy, would he have bumped into some sort of like maybe maybe shoeing was originally meant to? I don't know. Give him that outfit. Is this Rio three times? I guess it is because of his armbands. So this could be the the training era. That looks like a um, Akira stance, don't it? That I can't remember the move, but that's very much a, like a Baji Quan move, isn't it? And then obviously you've got Niao Sun in the background there if you didn't notice. I did, to be fair, you did notice her in the like a very low quality image of that. But whether whether or not that meant that Niao Sun was to be introduced. Um uh, we got we've got a bit of a spam bot thing here. You don't want your wares, thank you. And obviously this is very interesting now that you've seen it in the full high-res definition because this obviously looks to be very similar to Niawu. You've got that sort of the promenade. You can still see my cursor, right? Yeah. You've got the promenade there. Um, I don't know if this was originally what Yusuzuki intended for Niawu or this was like a different village, but very much, much so is now looks like Niawu Niau to me. Uh, you've got Yan Lang again. Obviously, we got Mr. Muscles. So whether or not Mr. Muscles was like a bit of a someone that they, they added in in Shemu 3. And maybe Yan Lang was meant to be a little bit... It is the same guy, right? Just going off the hair there. Looks very much Yan Lang rather than Mr. Muscles, I guess. Um, there's Ren. And then I couldn't tell if this was two chamfors in the sun because you've got the sort of like the nice sunset here. Rio, this guy I always thought was a bad guy, but looking at it in detail now, he looks like he's sort of hanging off Rio's head. So he's sort of it's kind of suggesting he's training Rio, I think, and that is 
you know, potentially the stance of the, the body check, I guess. Or I think it's just depicting that he's a bit stronger, but this could be because we've seen concept artwork of Master Bay where he was like very much thinner with a, a beard like that more so than this guy. This guy kind of looks to me maybe like the basis for um, is it Grandmaster Son? Grandmaster Son? Who's the old man that um, trains Rio in Bailey Village? Potentially just could be like a, a different design of that guy. Because there's the, the footwear, you know, his, his sort of toes are hanging out the, the, the shoes. Looks a bit more like that to me. So that could just be showing you that he trained Rio to this strength, you know, with bloody chicken catching and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, very much enjoyed that. Um, that kind of took quite a bit of time up actually just going through there. But I think that's something that Shemu fans are really pined for seeing this artwork in its original glory so um i don't know if you do see this adam at some point but thanks for sharing that that's really appreciated hopefully one day we'll get to see the rest in game form <laughs> so i will close that one now well let's get back to where we were at guys so i also mindful that you typed a lot of stuff then but do I want to spend the next five minutes reading through it all? Let's see what you've got. I'll see if I can sum it up quickly. Yeah, these pictures are insane, aren't they, sheep? Uh, issue with that, the silhouettes are meant to be Grandmasters, not for Chio men. Escort, and yeah, I think we did always think that, didn't we, with the, the cliffs, and they're all standing on top of each of the cliffs. Random yellow heads, yeah. I guess so. Miss Rex, yeah. Um... Makes me want continuation of the series even more. I know Retro Man. When you see all these chapter tiles, and maybe he's just re sort of like rejig them around, and we will get back to whatever was going on with you know the train and all that sort of stuff. It would be amazing, as long you know. I I, I kind of don't mind because it kind of seemed like that was originally scrapped, if you know what I mean. Because Shemu Two on the Dreamcast led to Bailu Village, didn't it? So which we've just seen depicted in that fifth chapter tile. So it seemed like maybe they'd already made the decision to skip three and four. But what blew my mind when I was thinking about it is, is there a build of the Saturn version? You know, when you're watching that trailer of the Shemu on the Saturn, and it covers Shemu 1, Shemu 2, up to Bailu Village. They had that running on the Saturn. You don't think there's a bloody build out there which had, you know, that third and fourth chapter considering the Saturn build is like 1996 when these artworks were quite freshly made going off that sort of a timeline if, if these artworks so Yu Suzuki went to China to research in 94 I believe the start of 94 then they started working on Virtual Fighter RPG sort of year 95 which is where those chapter tiles would have been produced and then 96 up until the Dreamcast they worked on the Saturn footage and they got to Guilin, do you reckon they scrapped three and four? Or is there a bloody build of the Saturn somewhere that's got, you know, potentially Shuzu? And um, I think that's what this other one was saying here. Perhaps not this topic. There was a topic that had them laid out. Um, I think I did bookmark that. No, maybe I didn't. Or is it here? Oh, it's here, sorry, yeah. So those books, these books... Obviously, those are the first five chapters as scripts, and someone's actually kindly translated them. So it goes Yokosuka, Hong Kong, Shuzo. So we know that third chapter is Shuzo, so that's the train chapter. Guilin is four, which is unusual, actually. Have I got rid of the... I think I got rid of the chapter tile things, didn't I just? I wonder if we can just get that back up. There we go. Because that, I don't know, does that look guilin to anyone? There's a, I didn't even notice actually, there's an arena down here with the yin yang symbol. And crowds of people watching whatever's going on here. And actually, that's very ominous the way that, 
Yuanda Zhu's sort of watching over this arena. I know there's always that theory that he's he's a bit of a bad guy. And when you see him like this, he does look quite evil looking there, doesn't he? <laughs> Sat there with these minions behind him and he's he's like sort of over, overseeing this fighting arena. And everyone's smirking. And obviously Rio's triumphant, we'd assume, <laughs> if he made it to the fourth the fifth chapter. Um Yeah. Just a little point I thought I'd make there. Where were we? Sorry, let's get back. I was reading the chat. One of them looks like Lao Yem. So much yet to be covered. Maybe Rio and Ren are supposed to travel to Suzo together originally. Possibly. Wanda Zoo, amazing stuff. Well, Rio... Ooh, where's that gone? My chat just um, leapt for some reason. Will Shenmue go into Supernatural like Rio fighting Chio? Possibly. If you're um, led to believe that Shenmue online stuff. Shimmer 3 is out. Can you imagine the law speculation from 10 years ago? Yan Lang is Geo. I know. It just shows you what a difference a game makes. Not to make that sound like a song. What amazes me about the artwork is how close a lot of the concept art was the final game. That's true. When you look at the first two chapters and that Niao Wu chapter, actually, now if you look at that and think that that is like Niao Wu, it looks very, very similar, doesn't it? Concept from the original Saturn game. Yep, which it is. I guess if Rio and Ren originally travelled to Suzu together, it would make more sense than Ren randomly popping up in Niawu. Yes, possibly, Stu, repurpose Shuzo, or is it? I don't know. It's one of those, it's a bit touch and go. Does that city look like Niawu, or does it look like what they imagined for Shuzu? Because I've been to Shuzu, and it is very much like that as well, like a canal city. Um, so I can see the similarities to, to both. And obviously, Niawu is a made-up name. Look at Yuan, don't know, they really stuck. Yeah, might be Baisha. There's, it's jumped again. There's a Badip Kagoda in the background. I should have read this while I was looking. Sorry, guys, I just rambled on, didn't I? Yeah, true, Shansun. Yan Lang was probably the better of the two bosses. His hand on Rio's head is symbolic of him teaching. Yeah, I think so. Seems like a sensei, Master Son. Master Son, yeah. Yeah, Shundi, the drunken guy. I reckon that's who that's supposed to be based on. Um, Yusuke, I cannot say it's too much about this artwork because it's quite far from where Shemu 2 stopped. All I can say is that those characters are not Chia men. They are Grandmasters. Sean Hastings, welcome, by the way. I don't know if I said hi to you. He thinks there could be more on the Saturn build, to be honest. That point. Oh, mate, I wish I... If someone come across that at some point, hopefully it's not lost. Like, you know, how they were chucking out loads of old Sega stuff back in the day. They didn't really think to archive it all. Surely, you've got to have more than that bloody trailer we've got. Images and footage of Niao Son. Yeah. Seeing that where she's walking for the trees, that forest. That could be what that is, that Guilin shot. Boat chapter was built for Saturn, possibly. Rose Garden. Uh, you think they've st they've taken that idea, Terry? Because if anything, that one with the the arena with the yin and yang symbol, that's the the martial arts dojo in the hour, right? The you know at the far end of the pier. I forget the name of it, but I'm sure that's got like a yin and yang symbol where they're fighting. Um, China's an unused model in the Dreamcast Shemu 2, probably for the boat chapter. Yeah. And maybe they had intentions to like kind of show it that he was following Rio and he, that he didn't die. Or yeah, I guess I suppose there was probably a lot of stuff they cut from Shemu 2 in general anyway, and that's why we got the the comic pages to sort of um, fill the gaps. Um, I know. <laughs> Right, guys, I'm almost caught, caught up, so let's carry on. Correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't the Tibet Gil Rio was going to be a different character? In the whole... I think, I don't know, S. Cotton, I think what I was reading, I don't know if it's in, the, it could be in the Switch's post, because I have read this recently, but we've got these, these are like a, a Chinese calendar from back in the day. Um, Just wait until it pops up on the screen so I can see what I'm showing you. I'm sure there's one image here. That looks like Shem for what you're saying in Tibet. 
Probably that that one, right? Maybe. And apparently they they were just costume designs. I think there was a quote. It could be in this post. We could get to it. But there was a quote that I've read recently that that Yu Suzuki said that he originally intended um, Shenfar to like change clothes because he was saying that. That was like another crazy detail you Suzuki wanted to go into. Characters would naturally wear different clothes for different days, different seasons. So they designed all this this concept art of her in all these different outfits that at some point they planned for her to wear. And obviously that was probably a bit too ambitious for the time that she would change costumes. So in a sense, when you hear something like that, it kind of makes sense that he would want to change a costume for Shenmue 3, whether or not that had any other implications, whether I feel like maybe they were struggling with like the outfit, like the Shenfar's original outfit clipping. Obviously, they can't change Rio's jacket, but Rio's arms do clip a little bit through his jacket. So potentially if they had a little issue with the clipping of his jacket, with the um, motion cap and all that sort of stuff, wireframe, Perhaps they had a, a problem with a walking in a big long roby thing, so they decided to go for like that skin sort of tight. That that could be my my theory of why they changed the the outfit. But I would like to think that maybe Yu Suzuki just wants to go back to his original idea of changing outfits. Um, so hopefully, I just showed you that Tibet thing there. Right, let's crack on, guys. 100 birthdays, yeah. Stu, I'm with you on that, matey. I know, imagine if they did that. That's It's Yu Suzuki all over there, that is, isn't it? cheap? just changing all their outfits of all the characters <laughs> every day. It's just Rio in his sweaty shirt. But if he did go in his wardrobe, he did have a whole bunch of um, white shirts, so... So going back about half an hour, guys. <laughs> um, so that that's what they were saying there. So Gentai, again, I don't know who's decided that that's Gentai, but possibly. Rantai is Landi, East Spring, makes sense. Um, now Sun, the South, these are the leaders. And Kotai, we haven't really seen. West Autumn, but it's that tiger sort of style. All this symbolization. Ooh, okay, so we're getting into some yin and yang territory now, which is probably another topic for another day, but while we're on this video. Uh, not sure what all these words... So let's read this middle bit. So the ancient symbol of harmony reminds us that life is a balancing act and most fulfilling when we learn to embrace its dual dualities, the ups and downs, Good times and bads, joys and challenges, is that? Yeah. So these are the opposites, aren't they? Dark, light, hidden, obvious, wavering, direct, feminine, masculine. Can't say that these days, can you? Round, straight, flexible, solid, night, day, moon, sun, passive, active, Ice, fire, shade, light, wet, dry, slow, fast, tired, lively, soft, hard, earth, sky, internal, external, winter, fall, spring, summer, left, right, interior, exterior, negative charge, positive charge, intuition, logic, rest, movement, calm, energetic, soothing, vibrant, tiger, dragon. Oh, when you read that one, Rio. Landy, so that's symbolization. <laughs> have they really gone this deep, do you think? And that when they were designing these games, obviously they have, because you wouldn't take anything in Shemu for granted, would you? But Tiger Dragon, Yin Yang, it's just insane, isn't it? Some of the things that you can pull from the research and stuff they've done for this is mad, and how it all lines up perfect. 
Storage usage, quiet load, receptive, creative, deaf, life, closed space and open space. While gathering information for this video, I noticed there's more to the numbers. Four and seven. Yeah? Although if you read Phantom Riverstone's other post on the Meow Village stuff from that Game Jam beta, originally I think there was supposed to be seven wooed. So that's an, another interesting point, actually, when you think of the sevens. I feel like they're reaching a little bit here with the Fantastic Four, but <laughs> perhaps not, because what, if you got a um, stone, fire, wind, and whatever? I don't know. <laughs> so there's a lot of fours, basically. And there's a lot of sevens. Although... If I went about out of my way, could I come up with like movies that were like, you know, <laughs> I almost said Fast and the Furious 8 then, obviously. <laughs> What's that film where um, it's kind of like, it's, it is a number film, isn't it? There is a number film. What's it called? Ocean's Eleven. You know, if you go out your way, perhaps, you, you know, you. I don't know if this is all symbolic or not. It's interesting, though. What's going on with this old lady face? Honesty, better to fail with honesty than succeed by fraud. Truth, it's always easiest to speak the truth. That's true. Humility, to be humble about your accomplishment is to be strong. Love, it is important to care for one another. Wisdom, with hard work and dedication will come knowledge. Courage, let nothing stand in the way of doing the right thing. Respect, give it, earn it, receive it. Very much kind of like wooed, aren't they, almost? I don't think that's got anything to do with Shenmue. That's just um, another point about the seven. Right, let's get back to the post. So that all stemmed from this one image. <laughs> so let's crack on. So the representation of the phoenix as a guardian is brought up by Yuishi-san at the antique shop when he examines the phoenix mirror. While Shuyu was not familiar with the mirror itself, or san has some knowledge on its background. He suggests that it's made of a special type of stone specific to Guilin in China, and that its creation was ordered by the emperor at the time. So, Oishi, I think perhaps this type of precious stone is only found in the Guilin region. According to the book I once read long ago, an emperor ordered a sculpture from Guilin to engrave a guardian onto a stone mirror. The phoenix on this mirror is a guardian. So, let's go back to my trusty... Okay, so it is this first cutscene. Excuse me. Oh, Hazuki Sensei's boy. I could really use your expertise again. Of course, provided it's something I am familiar with. Is it about the sword handguard from the other day? No, it's about this. Hmm, may I take a look? What a marvelous stone phoenix mirror. Stone mirrors were produced in China during ancient times. This is an exceptional piece. Is there anything unusual about this one? Indeed there is. Agreed, I sir. think perhaps this type of precious stone is only found in the Guilin region. Precious stone? I guess. They were one game at According one point, but... According to a book I once read long ago, an emperor ordered... This is Shemu 3 lore, though. Guilin ...to engrave a guardian onto a stone mirror. Guardian? The phoenix on this mirror is a guardian. Is there any connection between the phoenix and the stone from Guilin? Well, I really can't speculate. 
But considering the legend associated with this mirror, undoubtedly there is a connection. I see. Well then, thank you very much for your help. You're welcome. Right, cool. So yeah, the R, that is probably a crazy foreshadowing sort of moment there. He's read a book that the Emperor ordered a Phoenix mirror to be created, right? So he's seen that mirror that was made all those years ago, nearly, what, 80 years ago, whatever, I think. We'll get to that in a moment. In front of him. So some guy in Japan is showing him. So this is a guy that owns an antique shop for a start, who <laughs> probably loves antiques. He's seen something he's read about in an old book. That's crazy. Um, here you go. The phoenix on this mirror is a guardian. And like you say, it is foreshadowing for Shaman 3, because obviously you actually seen, you seen a cutscene, which when people sort of pass off Shemu 3 as like not having much story or whatever, yeah, okay, you can kind of see it to a certain degree, but there is some really nice story elements in there. And obviously seeing uh, all this lore about the Verdant Bridge, I think Switch does mention the Verdant Bridge and stuff, so we'll get to that at some point. Um, but yeah, foreshadowing of that Emperor event that you then get to Guilin, get to Bailey Village and learn from the locals about who were actually there when that stuff was happening. It's like really, really cool how that sort of um, a connected cutscene there. All the way back in Shemu 1, like, like Stu said. So near the end of Shemu 2, when Rio was at Shenfor's house, he notices a book there about constellations. So we're back into the sort of star constellation stuff that's really interesting, I think. When Rio asked Shenfor about it, she explains that the Big Dipper is one of the Xing Shus. Xing Shus. 28 traditional constellation groups defined in Chinese astronomy and astrology. She talks about a premonition she had recently when observing it. And I'm going to attempt, guys. Again, this is my very first stream on my own without Matt. And Matt normally does all this stuff. But I've got a controller here. And we're going to... Just because I, I couldn't really find this as such on YouTube. So instead, we're going to play it. Because <laughs> I've got to save right by this moment. Hopefully, this isn't too loud. This should be quite seamless, hopefully. I'm going to check on my OBS that this works. Let me know if there's any issues with the game. If it's too loud or anything. We're going to actually get that cutscene with the Constellation book. Looking okay, I think. I've set the volume quite low on the game. So, potentially it could be too low, or it could be perfect. Um, hopefully you can still hear me over this, guys. Uh, let me know if you can't. So, S. Cotton says, Here is a horrible thought. What happens if all of our speculation about mythology, meanings, and connections become largely bunk? Yeah. We didn't really get a satisfactory answer for the large mirrors in the cave. I mean, what do you actually think? Or what do you actually... Peter said this to us, actually, on one of the podcast episodes. He's like, what, what do you actually want? What are you expecting to find out about those relics? Um, which is a good point. Like, what, what would be a satisfying answer to why they're working on them? Could it just be like a, a symbolization or is there a, a bigger meaning? Um, I suppose if you're going off the Shemu 2 ending, there's got to be a big meaning because of how it's all integrated and set up with the sword floating, the light beam hitting, the fire lights up the room. Or is that just a very cool way of turning the lights on in a cave? I don't know. Is that you know, <laughs> is that because they haven't got power in a cave? Is that like the next best thing? Floaty sword, light thing, beam, boom. I don't know. <laughs> um, game audio is a bit low. I'll turn the game up, up a little bit. I 
I'm not going to talk for this bit anyway. This book. Book on constellations. The Xingxu are explained. Xingxu? The stars that affect the fates of people. The Big Dipper is one of them. The Big Dipper? The North Star is said to be the god that deals with death. The harbinger of death. When the North Star flickers, something bad happens. Like last night. I was watching the Big Dipper when I got this bad feeling. Bad feeling? That's why I couldn't go to sleep and started singing. So that was why. Love that cutscene. Just because... I mean, back in the day when we, we first saw that and you had this sort of implication that something bad had happened, Harbinger of Death, the North Star flickered, I saw the star flicker. When you get to the cave and you've got that note from Mr. Yuan, who's left it, you know, go with the one that holds the phoenix, hold this sword, take this, you know, the sword of the seven star. It sounded like he died, didn't it, basically? And this kind of like sort of emphasised that point that something bad might have happened. I don't know if a star would flicker for someone being kidnapped. Um, read into that how you believe, or maybe something bad did happen um, that wasn't the Mr. Yuan being kidnapped. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, that's a pretty cool cutscene. And while we're here, let's have a look at a, a couple of others while we're here. This is could be another reference to the Cliff Temple. This painting. Somewhere in Guilin. Really? I heard these mountains are scary. Scary? Those who set foot in these mountains have never returned. It's an old tale. Why? I don't know. But no one goes near these mountains today. Right, I don't know if she actually said Guilin, but I've typed in mountains in Guilin. And we'll investigate if there's some sort of a uh, an area in China <laughs> where there's some stories of people never returning. I don't know. Last one. This is embroidered. My father has had that tapestry for a long time. Where is this place? Luoyang. Luoyang. An old city that flourished during the Tang Dynasty. The sunset colors the whole city beautifully. Have you ever been there? No. But for some reason, it gives me a nostalgic feeling. Nostalgic feeling? I see it when I close my eyes. The landscape of the city. And the people bustling by. Luoyang. Mind-blowing, isn't it, that? Absolutely mind-blowing. Hopefully that's not scrapped. I say hopefully because obviously that wall scroll's changed in Shimmer 3. In case you're watching this and you don't know what I mean there, there's a different wall scroll there now. It's like, it's just a picture of Bailey Village, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, pretty crazy stuff. If that's... She can picture the landscape of that city when she closes her eyes. It's very much like what people were saying in the chat about like the 100 birthdays, um, whether or not she's lived another life where she, she maybe she was around in the Tang Dynasty. That's something we're going to have to investigate. Oh, it's going to be interesting to investigate that. Mountain warriors, that could be what those cliffs are, or, um, sheep. I mean, I keep I don't know why I keep getting rid of that tab. We might as well leave that tab up. That one. Could those be the mountains depicted in that scroll, or could we just be... Mad Shemu fans reading too much into any old little thing. It's just like a oh, someone just thought maybe we could say that there's a picture of some mountains. Let's put them here, and oh, that's where people went missing. 
Um, right, let's crack on because I've got something really cool to show you and I'm, I'm looking at the time here and I did want to keep these down to two hours so we've got another half an hour. And I don't think we're like halfway through this list yet. So, And I don't want to rattle through it as well. We might as well save it for part two if, if that comes to happen. Um, again, Big Dipper reference. She was looking up at the sky, saw the North Star flicker. You know, she was looking for the Big Dipper, praying to it. That's what we um, learned earlier on that, you know, People pray to the Big Dipper, these um, guardians of the sky for the, the Sky Lord. Um, pretty cool. Uh, can imagine the ending of the Shemu journey being something truly jaw dropping. Yeah, retro, especially if Yu Suzuki gets to tell his tale. All these people that want it to, to end. Oh, it should have ended in Shemu three. Oh, it needs to end in Shemu four. This is where I'd, I'm. I'm not. I don't. I'd rather it didn't happen. To be honest, at all. And we're just left with a sort of like, you know, what we're talking about now. Because if they did say Shemu 4 was the last game in the series, and then you get it, and they don't cover any of their stuff because Yu Suzuki decided, you know, this, we're going to have to finish the game. People get that Landy Rio fight that, you know, everyone seems to want. And I don't want that. I mean, I do want that to a certain degree, but I, I want this stuff more. I want to, to learn more about this stuff and how it it's interconnected into Shemu. I think they've they've gone out of the way to um mention these themes and these topics and these things too much at this point for them to not lead anywhere. So if that requires two more games, for example, to be able to flesh out and get some sort of a a conclusion from what's going on with all this big dipper bollocks and and whatnot then i would rather that to be honest over a rushed ending that there's a few fans out there that would like to just i don't know why they want an, an ending a sudden ending because i feel like that might spoil it more than aid i don't would it give you closure if it was a bad ending Um, any Shemu 4 news? Not particularly. Matt did cover a, a, a recent rumor video. If you, if you, after the stream, if you go onto the the YouTube channel, you can catch Matt's video on um, on that that recent rumor, which I suppose is interesting. It gets the conversation talking, and I agree with you, Sue. I, I hope Leo Wang isn't scrapped. I hope hope that just some sort of a intricate detail that they kind of had to do for some reason to try and get it out in china and i believe because it wasn't released in china would you know are they going to go out the way to try and make those sort of um cuts and emissions and that sort of stuff just to sort of appease the chinese market or whatever for a fourth game when the third game when they did that didn't even happen so yeah hopefully they don't bother with that anymore and if they're not going to get it in, released in China, even with the cuts, you know, don't don't bother cutting anything like that. Just try and keep it as as true as you can. Because I used to, I, I like the series for being very original, and having like you know your Yukoska, your Guilin, your Hong Kong, your Kowloon, you know, places that you can somewhat visit. Aberdeen, I think you can visit Mamo Temple, you know, actual real life places. Whereas in Shemu Three, obviously they made a lot of changes where it's like Manyuan Temple that doesn't exist. I suppose it doesn't because Bailey Village doesn't exist, but you, you, hopefully you get my point there. Niawu is based on Shuzo. I wish it was called Shuzo and not Niawu. Just those little things like that is because then on a Shemu pilgrimage, you know now to go to Shuzo. I suppose if Yu Suzuki came out and said Niawu was based on Shuzo, then you, you know, you're, you're still sort of getting that sort of effect. Um, hopefully you get my point there. <laughs> um right okay let's not get into the the shemu sort of um shemu 4 talk let's just crack on with this so five stars corp this is a very interesting point uh, so in shemu 2 yuanda zoo's mysterious trading business is named five stars corp could there be a hidden sorry i'm a bit gassy actually from <laughs> Um, could there be a hint contained in his name, in this name? So five stars is also the number of stars in Cassiopeia. The constellation that we learned represents the dragon guardian, 
according to Chinese legend. So again, this is sort of emphasizing that point we, we talked about a little bit earlier about, uh, you know, Yuanda Zhu potentially being a bad guy. Um, again, that was sort of when I was showing that concept art, him sort of having the sort of evil gaze over this arena, potentially. Um, would he name his business Dragon Corp? You know, if you want to translate it like that, five stars. Um, kind of seems like another hint towards him being potentially on the dragon side of things. If you're thinking of the yin and yang, you know, your tigers, your phoenixes. Uh, is phoenix good? I don't know. I know the phoenix mirror is good, but Niao Sun is this sort of sun vermilion bird, so I don't know. Probably you're best going for your tiger dragon, so dragon is your bad sort of side, right? Like light and dark, Star Wars. Ooh. There's another little yin and yang reference I've just come up with. So yeah, very interesting. That Sword of the Seven Stars, a more obvious case connection with the constellations is the Sword of the Seven Stars that Shen Fa's father leaves for us in the stone pit. Named according to the number of stars in the Big Dipper, it is inscribed with the seven star pattern of the Big Dipper on its blade. And look how prepared I am, guys. I've got my little Sword of the Seven Stars here. And yeah, you can actually see on the base of the. Oh, hang on. I'm trying to work with a mirror image. So we've got that sort of somewhat Big Dipper style seven star formation there on the base of the sword. And obviously, these are Phoenix, is the. Um, would that be the handguard for this particular blade? Very cool. Um, really nice item that's actually from the limited run complete collector's edition uh, really sharp as well wouldn't want to um, stumble into a dark alley with anyone sheaving this behind the you know <laughs> probably would do a bit of damage oh shit I just dropped it probably uh, smashed my PC into a million pieces there very cool um it is, and we're looking at it. It is a phoenix. I don't know if anyone ever noticed that as prominently as it is on the blade here. Very good re recreation, actually. There's the phoenix head. Um, I, to be honest, I, I much preferred this great sword version. I know it's not feasible that they carry that around with them. Um, keep this sword as a part of my whatever he says, Mr. Yuan. Um, you know, don't ever let go of the sword, carry it with you everywhere. <laughs> I suppose it would be a bit weighty. Um, so taking a closer look at the model of the sword that appears in the game, it can be seen that the hilt design consists of a phoenix, Yep, whose wings from the cross guard, its tail running along the grip, embedded with its tail are a pattern of red decorative jewels in a pattern of the stars of the Big Dipper, details that are easily missed during the gameplay. Yeah, very, very cool, isn't it? It is, it is literally, so it is the Big Dipper formation there. Let me just double check that they've got that nailed on. They've done the best I reckon they could with that. On such a, a little object. Done pretty well there, limited run. Uh, what was interesting, Stu? Sorry, I've, I've missed the chat. Dragon Guardian. I'm going to lose my train of thought as we go through this. So the whole wheeling section, yeah. Zhu's business could be as shady as Master Chen's. Yes, okay, you're on about the Rwanda Zoo. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. So I smell treasure. The association of the mirrors with treasure of some kind is something that has been hinted at since the first game. Yamagashi san has this to say about the Phoenix mirror that Ryo has uncovered in the basement at the dojo when he sees him at Sakurioka Park. And we're going to actually watch this cutscene again in a moment. But the Phoenix is a sacred bird of legend, but this has an ominous feel. In China, there are many treasures that contain both good and bad fortune. This is called the secret of yin and yang. You'd best be careful. This may have something to do with your father's unfortunate death. His words are rather general, however, without specifying exactly how such treasures relate to the mirror. Right, so that's the next good scene. Let's go for it. Excuse me. Oh, Ryo. Is this a good time? 
What's on your mind? I want to show you something. What is it? Uh, this. What an unusual stone mirror. Apparently, it is called the Phoenix Mirror. I see. There is a phoenix carved into it. Is there anything special about this mirror? Hmm. Well, the phoenix is a sacred bird of legend. But, uh, this has an ominous feel. Ominous? In China, there are many treasures that contain both good and bad fortune. This is called the secret of yin and yang. The secret of yin and yang? You're trying to emphasize the only... This may have something to do with your father's unfortunate death. I don't know if this death. information helps, but that's all I can tell you. I see. Thank you. Right. Very good, very good. So again, like I say, the secret of yin and yang, that could be another thing, topic that we should... Do we need to look into that, actually? I'll write it down, but we did kind of cover that with that video that was quite... Um, I'm not sure if we're going to learn much more about that. Um, something that we could do, actually, at some point is watch Shemu and Official's videos on that, because he did a really good yin and yang video. That might be quite interesting. Uh, doo -doo -doo. What did I read? That I, yes, um, Impact Gaming. Welcome, by the way. And honestly, the research that went into this is... I don't think any other game out there has done that much research of any kind. I mean, perhaps those people that do, like... I don't know. Like, people that research Assassin's Creed, like Egypt and that sort of stuff, possibly want the, like, a... Um, a game mode in that Assassin's Creed Origins where they uh, used it in a school or something to, because it was like the actual one-to-one -one recreation of Egypt or something. So I suppose that depends on much research you're kind of classing here is like a lot of research, but definitely Yu Suzuki and his team, when they created these games, they were planned out meticulously to a certain extent. I, 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 don't, I don't know if they're still following that, all that sort of whatever they were all working together on, obviously different personnel and stuff not the same team working on the future of the series as there was on these first two games. So a lot of those theories and research and stuff potentially could be lost, I don't know. Hopefully not, though. Uh, next point, the Chiyo. So a key character that, re that tells Ryo about the significance of the mirrors and their combined effect is Master Chen at New Yukosuka Arbor. Unlike the antique shop owners, he recognises it on site. Ah, the Phoenix Mirror. Yes, it's made of Phantom Riverstone. He then passes on the information that he was told by someone by the name of Zhu Yuanda. A long time ago, Zhu Yuanda once told me when the dragon and phoenix meet, the gates of heaven and earth will hope open. And that's kind of what you know you, you picture in your head after you've seen that Shemo Online trailer. When you when you hear this after watching the Shemo Online trailer, I just picture that shit going down um, in that trailer. And Chiyo will resurrect itself on Earth. It's a legendary Chinese monster that will devour, devour this world of ours. It appears Landy will try to make use of both mirrors. What will they try? That I even don't know. That I even don't know, rather. Uh, so this next video is from... I'll give him a subscription here. Another six subscriber channel here. Shenmue stuff. Um, bit of a shout out. I just stumbled across your video. It's kind of, we should have this, to be honest, on our dojo vault by now. But slack it a bit there. But we'll use this dude's... Ah, the Phoenix Mirror. Yes, it's made of Phantom River Stone. Why did Landy only steal the Dragon Mirror? He probably didn't realize your father had both of them. Two mirrors. A long time ago, Chu Yuan Da once told me, when the dragon and the phoenix meet, the gates of heaven and earth will open, and Chi Yu will resurrect itself on earth. 
Ji Yu. It's a legendary Chinese monster that will devour this world of ours. It appears Lan Di will try to make use of both mirrors. What will he try? That even I don't know, but you mustn't allow him to get that mirror. Be careful and stay alert. If he finds that mirror, it will be the end of you. All right, cool. Um, so that's a good point. Someone just mentioned was it S. Cotton? Yeah. Imagine if Yuandazu was like one of the big bosses. That'd be a, a really good twist, wouldn't it? In a sense. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I think if you were looking at the... I don't know why I keep closing them. Those chapter artworks we got earlier. Yeah, that guy isn't Yuandazu, if you know what I mean. If you're basing that theory on that. But yeah, it would be pretty cool actually if um, he is. But he can't really do much in a wheelchair, can he? Unless he springs out of it and... You know, it was a bit like the blind guy, Kai, whatever his name is, where he was like sort of faking the disability. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Although in the anime, he's, he's definitely disabled, I guess. You want to zoom? Uh, right. So Master Chen's words can be inter interpreted as meaning that when the two mirrors are combined, it will lead to a legendary monster named Chi Yo resurrecting itself on Earth. And I don't know about you guys, but when I first played Shenmue, that comment sort of just passed me by. I mean, it was curious, but it isn't until really the end of Shemu 2, where when you actually go back and play the first game and you're hearing all these bits and pieces that they've, they've spoon-fed you throughout the journey so far, this, it did feel like, oh crap, this could be where the game's leading. If Landy gets both the mirrors, this is intention to release this mythical monster. Whether or not that is an actual physical being or it's more of like a, um, what we just looked into, like more like a symbolization thing? Was it like greed and, um, you know, those sort of negative elements of someone's person? You know what I mean? It, it sort of brings that out of them. Because people in search of treasure, so say if, if these two mirrors are the key to treasure, that could in itself be a monster, if you know what I mean, because you're on, you're opening something to greed and you know all these treasures, um, that kind of a, a sort of thing. I'm trying to trying to articulate. <laughs> so the mirrors in the King Dynasty. So in a memorable cutscene at Ren's Hideout in Shimmer Two, Yuandazu reveals that the Dragon and Phoenix mirrors form a key of some kind, and that's the next cutscene we're going to watch. Actually, so um, I won't read that. We might as well watch it. I've got them here. Ooh, that's a bit loud in my ear, sorry. Don't know if it's a louder video in general. But this is CB0. How cruel can fate be? Please tell me, why did Landy kill my father? He was like you. Vengeance. Vengeance? Landy avenged the death of his father, Sun Ming Zhao. Do you remember Sun Ming Zhao? Sun Ming Zhao. Uh, that name. Landy's real name is Long Sun Zhao. He is the son of Sun Ming Zhao. That's a little bit of a... We, we just learnt the name, Long Sun Zhao, right? That can't be true. Father would never kill. I'd like to believe that myself, but I don't know what really happened. So, I mean, is at the end of Shenmue 3, it's like he's learning that? It's like a new thing? That Iwao brought Zhao's mirrors to Japan. The mirrors. 
Mingzhao was my best friend. If he had lived, he would have become a legendary martial arts master. My father had this mirror. This is... there's no mistake. It's the mirror once owned by Suming Zhao. Landy took the dragon mirror. So if you're thinking you under Zeus... Is that so? Is that some sort of an evil look there? Is he... has he been...? I don't want to listen to these depressing stories. I want to know about this mirror here. Has he been a bit deceptive here, or...? When this phoenix mirror is paired with the dragon mirror, the two form a key. A key? Yes. A key to the treasures hidden away in order to revive the Qing dynasty. Revive the Qing dynasty, okay. <laughs> Did you hear that? Treasures, he said. I told you, my hunches are always right. And how do we get this treasure, huh? Excuse me, could you turn out the lights and light the candle? Sure. Love this cutscene. You should see this. What's the show? These seven lights indicate the light. Let me just stop it for a second. Do you reckon the colours of the lights mean anything? So you've got like white, blue, two kinds of green, a yellow, and an orange. Let me just take a photo of that. For like in case something springs up later where we're like, oh shit, there's those exact colours. <laughs> um, so I've noticed, so yeah, we assume Landy didn't know that Awao had both mirrors, otherwise he would have got both while he was there, right, surely? Rather than, you know, hunting his way down to Bailu Village and <clears throat> harassing stonemasons or whatever, he must have assumed that maybe Awao took one to Japan and maybe one stayed in China. You know, maybe it doesn't make sense that Iwa would have two because then if they were both found, then Chiyo could be found, you know, thingied there and then. Whereas if one's in China, one's in Japan, quite difficult, I guess, to be in two places at once. So perhaps that was Landy's thinking. I don't know. Definitely had a lot of lore stuff at the, at the end. Why does Chai say Landy hates Zoo? Hmm, that's interesting as well. Maybe they could all be working against each other if you think about it. Say if Zoo and I is one of the four leaders, Niao Sun obviously hates Landy at some point because she turns on Landy, sets his bloody castle on fire. So if they're all in it for themselves, that could be it. You know, that could be a potential reason there. You've got Landy who wants both mirrors to get to the treasure. I don't know, maybe Landy's intentions are a little bit different because he's doing it out of revenge, is he? Is he still doing it out of revenge? Does he want to... Like, what impact is resurrecting Chiyo in terms of his father dying, you know? Is that really a revenge situation? Um, obviously, Yuan Dezu knows all about treasure, reviving the King Dynasty or whatever. The Aosun obviously is greedy. You can tell by her character she's deceptive. Um, she wants both mirrors probably wants hands on the treasure. Ren wants his hands on the treasure. You know, there's a lot of people that want this treasure. Um, so yeah, it could make sense that th this is going off the theory that you wonder who's bad. He might be a good guy. You know, it's it's just these sides to to, to, to the story and these, you know, these fours and against his four his, his character where we're at here at the moment. Um but they could just all be out to do each other over. 
because it does make sense he's, he could be using Rio here go to Bailu village you know go go here go there go here you know do this for me you know I'll, I'll be there when you you know you've 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 got this mirror. Go get the other one. You know I'll be there, <laughs> kind of thing. And then he shows up, and Niawu don't he, and kind of Zhang's there again. Location of the treasure. Where is that? A single mirror is not enough. What? Only when this is combined with the light pattern from the dragon mirror will we know. There's no way of finding out with only the Phoenix Mirror. There is a clue. You must go to Guilin. Guilin? There is a place where Zhao and Iwao trained when they were young. My father? Go to Bailu village in Guilin. The mirrors are made of phantom river stone. One, two, three, four, five, six. Is the seventh light there actually, sheep? Is it in the one, two, three, four, five, six? There are seven. I think as the camera pans, it goes into the candle. So is there a red one there as well then? Yeah, there is a red one. So it goes red, orange, yellow, green, whatever colour that was, blue and white. Um, I think we've seen most of that cutscene right there. You go to Guilin, you go to Bailu Village. Okay. So we're coming up to the hour here, so let me just... Let me see. We'll get down to this point here. How much of this have we got to go? Let me just double check. There is quite a bit. I might have to save this for episode two. Sorry, guys. Um, but that's fine. Where were we at? Here we go. Right, so he places the single mirror in Rio's possession, the phoenix mirror on the table, blows smoke from his pipe across it. Obviously, he's an avid smoker. To Rio's amazement, the light pattern of the Big Dipper appears in the smoke. These seven lights indicate the location of the treasure. Obviously, it seems very obvious, really, when they talk about this. If that's the Big Dipper, you would assume that's coming out of the phoenix mirror, which is interesting, because the Big Dipper is the dragon, right? That's what we learned up here. Did we? Or was that on a different page? Uh, yeah, here you go. So, yeah, the Big Dipper is the dragon, and the Phoenix is actually the Cassiopeia one. So you'd assume that the dragon mirror, when you blow smoke over it, would have the, what is it, five stars of the, the Cassiopeia Phoenix. So that's why the repair, you know, Phoenix... Dragon constellation, dragon mirror, phoenix constellation. And if two mirrors combined show the location of a treasure, then you can kind of picture in your head based on what we've already learned. Here you go. Um, was there a better one? You're going to see that sort of thing, aren't you? If you blow smoke, it's going to—it's just going to be that in front of you, surely. So the location of the treasure in my opinion, would be the North Star. But then what does that actually mean? How is that a location that you can actually be at? You can't be there unless it's somewhere in the bloody sky. You can't, you know, Rio goes on a bloody Apollo 13 mission to the North Star. I don't know. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, interesting concept. I don't know if the North Star's particularly over something, because we... That's what I was talking about earlier when I was a bit couldn't understand how the world <laughs> rotates and um, so I don't really understand that. And that's the information we just read. So yeah, so only when combined with the light pattern from the dragon mill will we know. So there's no way of finding out only with the Phoenix mirror. But there is a clue, you must go to Guilin. And that's the place where Zhao Zhao and Diwao trained when they were young. So if you go to Bailu Village in Guilin, the mirrors are made Phantom Riverstone, only found in that village, the descendants of the one who made the mirrors live there too. So that's another interesting... Obviously, we learn about Mr. Yuan towards the end of Shemu too, but we don't know that he's the guy whose grandfather made the mirrors. Um, so that's another little interesting 
foreshadowing there that they did in Shenmue 2 for, for some of the storyline in Shenmue 3. So it does, you know, it's not it does quite link to Shenmue 3 quite well, actually. In the scene, we learn that, according to Zoo, the two mirrors must be used together to form a complete light pattern that reveals the location of the treasures, treasures that have been hidden away. The exact nature of these treasures is unclear, but Zoo indicates that they are for the revival of the Qing Dynasty. Or Qing, Qing, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that one. King, I'll say King. I think they say that in the cutscenes, right? King Dynasty revival. So I've wrote that down. We're going to have a look at that at some point when we get into these topics. So the King Dynasty was 1636 to 1912, right? And this is an interesting bit. I wish we could have got to it, but then that's kind of a nice cliffhanger for episode two of the stream. Uh, when we get to that, I don't know if I'm going to do this weekly or something. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how we get on. So the, the Qing Dynasty was actually the last Orthodox dynasty in Chinese history. So there was no more dynasties in 1912 it just sort of ended i think if, if, unless I've, I've misinterpreted that so the historical name of the last empire emperor emperor of this dynasty is the yuan tong emperor pu yi whose name will crop up again later in the story and we will talk about this further down in the post and it's really really cool actually i wish we could have got to it i don't know whether to give a little bit of a spoiler or save it i'll save it so Hopefully that will encourage you guys to come back and, and learn. Let's see. So if Switch is making this post available on the 4th. Ooh. I don't think I could stream before then. But, so you're going to get a chance to read it yourselves anyway. Oh, well, we could talk about it and then you'll all be in the know. <laughs> um, so remember that anyway, that empire's, uh, emperor's name, Pu Yi. Because when you think about what, what we think or what I thought about when you're hearing about the story of Shamfar as a little baby, a mum and dad, emperor and empress, have these mirrors made to, um, I don't know, lock a door to the treasures. I don't know how that works. Obviously, we're going to find that out maybe in the Shemu 4 or 5 or whatever. Um, but this empire, uh, um, I don't know why I keep saying empire, emperor guy and the empress thing those themes have always happened so when you actually learn about this Pu Yi guy and the way that they sort of describe him in Shenmue even in Shenmue 3 I pictured someone like Shenfar's father so it's quite interesting actually when I mean maybe you guys know this already but when you actually learn who this guy is and in particular how how old he was in 1910 1912 to order these mirrors to be made is quite interesting that's something that i want to delve in at some point okay but however the explanation given by yuanda zu seemingly contradicts the story master chen told ryo when he stated that yuanda zu told him that the mirrors may lead to chiyo resurrecting himself on earth is someone lying or do these two explanations in fact refer to the same thing so we're going to end on this as um we've come to the, t the two hours here Again, I know we've mentioned it quite a few times there. So, someone lying. I know Stuart said a little bit earlier, Master Chen has this um, contraband business. Maybe he's a little bit more sinister than he, he seems, especially in the anime. The, you know, they seem a bit more like they're into this sort of drug cartel, sort of a dealership. Perhaps not drugs as such, but like some sort of illegal sort of a business, Master Chen side of things. And then Yuanda Zhu here who has a, a company called Five Stars Corps. So it's like literally translates to Dragon Corporize, Corporate, Corporization. Corp, Corporation? Corporation. And he's telling a slightly different tale. So Master Chen's saying when these two mirror, mirrors meet, this bloody massive monster thing is going to devour the whole world. Whereas Yuan De Zhu's a little bit more softer spoken. He's saying when these two mirrors meet, they show you where treasure is. So, hmm. You know what I mean? Someone line, or do they both exist at the same sort of time? Someone might have mentioned that actually. I did see. Can they both exist? Can it be a monster and treasure at the same time? I don't know. Or is the the monster sort of a um, symbolization, like I mentioned, for like greed and lust and and stuff? So let's just. Crack on with these. This is what I read, actually. Developed at the same time. Possible both outcomes can be true when the mirrors are put together. 
Right. Someone, did someone mention that? Treasure, the Chiyo. Yeah, I think he did. Um, so what happens if you overlay the Big Dipper on a map? Does it line up with the locations in Shenmue? Ooh, I like that idea. Where would you start, though? Where would you start on a map? Would would you start in China, right? Specifically Guilin or Bailu Village, perhaps? Like, is there a point... I have got a map of China up here. I know Bailu Village isn't actually on the map, but if we go Guilin, just to end the stream on this. So you've got Guilin down here. Let's put a point on it. Can we put a little marker? How do you do this? Use this for a while. You can see Gwil in there anyway, so let's zoom out. Is it possible for. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing now, Sheep. What have you got me doing? Is there a Big Dipper formation? What even way round would the Big Dipper be? Because we, we saw like it, it revolves a bit, don't we? Like a swastika. I don't know, mate. You have a go at that, and we'll have a go next time, okay? <laughs> Um, so yeah alright guys I'm going to end it there thank you very much for joining so we'll next episode we'll carry on with this Switch's post and I'll give a little teaser actually because this is insane he did a I mean he's, he's probably a little bit upset we, we didn't get around to it but just check this out guys this is absolutely insane so he's designed this <laughs> so this is going to be amazing to um, try and decipher this. So he's done a mind map of how everything is intertwined. I don't even know where to start on this. Um, I wish there was a point to start on this sheep, like Guilin. <laughs> um, we might have to start in the middle. I don't know, how would you normally do a mind map? This is insane, isn't it? We just start at the top, perhaps? Um, I suppose the points he's just gone across, actually. Let's have a quick look at that. So. If we go back up to the top, he's got his... Um, so we've got down to here. Okay. So the prophecy is where we're at next. But obviously we have seen the legendary bird of fortune. Um, it's coming off the phoenix there, the empress. Um, the big dipper is one of the swing shui constellations, Chinese constellations. Oh, thanks for the follow, SNES. 66. Shattered my eardrums a little bit. Um, stone map at Russia dates back. This is insane. It's heads to grant wishes. Cassiopeia is made up of five stars. Possibly inspired that name. Five stars corpse, which goes down here. Let's see where this goes. Yuan de Zhu, friends with Master Chen. Um, also friends with um, Summing Zhao. Has he got that on here? Was friends with, yeah. Um, well, his father. That could be a... Not necessarily Randy. I might mention that to switch. You might want to put his father there. Raised by was a leader of the GMN. See how it all intertwines. It's insane. This this uh, mind map is. Uh, we'll definitely delve into that a little bit more next time, guys. So yeah, thank you very much for joining. And um, yeah, I'm not quite sure when it'll be. Maybe like an impromptu sort of stream like this. Just keep an eye out, guys. I'll, I'll post a tweet for the next episode and uh, you can always follow the VOD. I'd probably cut the start off, cut this ending off and um, try and tighten it down to a nice two hour episode for people on the VOD there. But yeah, really appreciate everyone coming. Um, yeah, I'm Skill Gem. Thanks for all of whatever you do for the dojo supporting. Um, we are back actually, I'll mention that quickly. We're back on the 4th with the stream. Me and Matt, of course, for Let's Get Shemu 4. So that is on Tuesday. So, yeah, probably best not do another stream until after that. So, yeah, I'll, I'll see you guys on the 4th. All the best. I should have an ending, actually. I haven't thought about that. That's one of the things. Let's see if this works. If this works, this is going to be a miracle because I haven't set this up. But hopefully when I press end scene, we're going to have the wish outro. <laughs> so, yeah, take care, guys. See you later.